Did a secret Nazi device travel through time and crash land in 60s USA? We're here to talk about it. This is Aliens and Stuff. Hi everyone and welcome to the Christmas special of Aliens and Stuff. I'm Mike and this is Tom and Spencer. And uh, this week um, we're here to ask the question, aren't we? Very Christmassy question, this one. <laughs> Did a secret Nazi device travel through time and crash land in 60s USA? Well, it's tangentially Christmassy, isn't it? Um, the bell? Ding dong merrily on high. Yeah, so I just wanted to do a brief disclaimer um, before we, we get into this subject, because um, obviously it's quite a contentious issue. Um, talking about Nazis does not make you a Nazi. Um, no. If we pretend that the past never happened, we're never going to learn the lessons of history, okay? And we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes ad infinitum. Completely so, agree. Spencer. No one thinks Nazis are cool. Nazis are dumb. They're scumbags. Let's just get that out there in the beginning. So, the bell. And a very strange question there. So, this actually starts off with a book, this story. And uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the truth about the Wunderwaffe. The Wunderwaffe. The yes. Wonder Weapon. The Wonder Weapon. The Wonder Weapon. There's been a quite a lot of mispronunciations over the last few episodes of different languages, so that yeah. is a good one. I think we've done okay on that. We've nailed the that. The is okay. I mean, I think, I think we've nailed Wonder that Waffer? one. Wonder I have that book. book. So, yes, you do. Um, and it's by Polish journalist Igor Witkowski, and it was released in the year 2000. Now, this book is thought to be, by many, many people, the first mention of a top-secret Nazi scientific technological device known as the Glocker or the, the bell. bell. The Bell. Which yeah. I know that you guys both know about. Yep. So um, I don't know if you know the background of the book though. Have you read the book? Not entirely. No. Okay, have you? No. But okay, right. It's one of those books that I own, Spencer, that looks very, very nice on the, uh, <laughs> on on the, the mantelpiece on the shelf. Okay, it's very much decorative. Not deep into reading, are we? No. <laughs> Maybe not. <clears throat> not, not. Not at the moment, not at the moment. I'm into so, YouTube, where a YouTube channel would kind of make sense. <laughs> Well, I'll give you a bit of background. So, uh, Witkowski, right? He claimed that he was given access to Polish government documents, okay? Yes. By a Polish intelligence officer back in August of 1997, okay? And those documents contain details of the war crime interrogation of former SS Lieutenant General Jacob Sporenberg, okay? Who I know that you know about already. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, in these documents, it describes uh, a, a technological device called de Glocker. And it's either a, a 10 foot by 5 foot or sort of 14 foot by 9 foot ceramic covered technological device which is shaped like a bell, thus de Glocker. And along the uh, base of the device is what can be described only as like occult symbols or, mm. or almost like hieroglyphics. And this has come up before, like we're in Dishman Forest. Yes, it has, yeah, um, oddly enough. Yeah, yeah, symbols around the base of the craft. And the device itself allegedly had chambers attached which were filled with a mysterious substance known as Zerum 525 or red, red mercury. mercury. Yeah. Red mercury, I've not heard of that, Spence. Right, okay, so it's, it's an alleged um, substance which can cause biological effects, such as gelation and separation of liquids, um, and also numerous functional disorders of the nervous system of the humans when uh, activated, okay? okay. Very, very strange device, okay? And it was spoken about by Witkowski as some sort of anti-gravity project, okay? Now, Nick Cook, who is a former aerospace journalist uh, and also ran a, a consultancy company called Dynamics, which is a defense industry consultancy, he wrote about de Glocker extensively in a book uh, called The Hunt for Zero Point. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this as well. Oh, I am, yeah. Cool. And Mike, have you come across this? I've never this? heard of this one, no. This is completely new to me. Well, he, he goes into a lot of detail in the book, and he claims that de Glocker was part of an anti-gravity program, as Witkowski said, but also that the technology used could possibly have been used to create some sort of time machine, okay? So this goes back to a few other episodes, doesn't it? We it, talked about this in Philadelphia Project with the time travel and yep. anti-gravity in, in Bob Lazar and also in, um, in, in episode two with mm -hmm. the, the Navy. So, sorry, Spence, carry no, on. No, 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 this, this is the interesting thing about it. We, this keeps coming up and it's it tying into so many things. I thought, 
you know, it's mm. Christmas, let's, let's do a big special. So just to add a bit of context, what I'm gonna do is, because I don't know how au fait you guys are with this, but give a, a quick crash course in esoteric Nazism as it will become relevant later, okay? okay. So obviously we all know about Hitler's doctrine of, of creating a master race. You know, yes. the Ubermensch, the Aryan race, uh, load of nonsense, but um, it had its roots in esotericism, okay? Uh, however, it goes a lot deeper than that, okay? So, are you familiar with the Thule Society? Yeah, the Vril, isn't it? The, the, uh, the Vril comes into it later, but the Thule Society. I've no, not I heard of that, no. no. Okay, cool. More so, of what Tom was talking about, not that. Yeah. Tell yeah. us more. Yeah. So, so, the Thule Society, right, was a, a, an occultist and nationalist group, okay? Which, which did exist. There's evidence that they existed, okay? We know that they existed. And they funded the DAP, which was the German Workers' Party, which eventually became the NSDAP, or the Nazi Party. So this is back in like the 20s and 30s? Yeah, yeah way back. Before, okay. before, way before Hitler ran, uh, came into power. And okay. they had obviously the Great Depression and everything in Germany, yeah. but there's yeah. a lot of countries did as well. Yeah. yeah. So, so the Thule Society actually dissolved before Hitler came into power. And some say that Hitler was involved with them, and some say that he actively made an effort to separate them from the political party, okay? Because, um, I mean, basically Hitler wasn't the biggest proponent in the Thule Society. No. Uh, and a lot of people talk about these, these kooky stories of, of sort of Nazi occultism and stuff. But Hitler's very often not the driving force in these things. So, so it tends to be more Heinrich Himmler. I know, okay. I know head, of, nice head of the military SS. Now, yes. he was a known occultist. He was the one who ordered the exhibition to Tibet, where they were searching for the origins of the Aryans and Shambhala. In Tibet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sent them to Tibet to look wow. at the origins of the Aryans. What was that? That was, that was before the war? That was during the war. Or during the war? During wow. the war. Um, wow. One of the Nazi secret projects. Um, he also was into uh, things like, he, there was a project called Hexen Kartathek, which was an investigation that Himmler demanded into the witch trials, where they were claiming that the witch hunters were the Catholic Church's attempt to get rid of Aryan women. We just okay. talked about that in the last episode as well, no, which is all which tying hunts. in weirdly. All tying it? in weirdly. Yeah, um, And as we all know, you know, uh, symbols used on the uniforms of the SS were sig runes, uh, the swastika is an ancient magical symbol. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of weird occult stuff going on with that, okay? Yeah. Now, my point is, is that there was a real uh, proliferation and, and belief in the occult in the upper echelons of the Nazi party, okay? Yeah. That, that's a known fact. Um, who and, and where and what capacity they were involved is, is a topic for some debate. Um, but another little interesting story, just to really uh, hammer the point home, is do you know who Rudolf Hess is? Yes, I do. Okay, so the deputy Führer, okay? Now, he defied Hitler towards the end of the war and threw Solo to Scotland in an attempt to negotiate peace with the United Kingdom. That story is ridiculous, my It's that. absolutely it happened, ridiculous. But it's like the, the, the actual circumstances surrounding what happened was absolutely crazy. Mind-blowing, absolutely um, mind-blowing. He, he completely went against Hitler and he wanted to basically negotiate a peace deal yeah. with the UK, didn't he? But he ended up crash landing he did in crash Scotland. Land. Yeah, and then, uh, and then they, they weren't very happy about it, let's no. just say that. They weren't open to peace talks. No. Um, now, the head of foreign intelligence, Walter Friedrich Schellenberg, reported to Hitler that the reason Hess made his flight was under the advice of an astrologer, okay? And Reinhard Heydrich, who was the chief of the Reich's main security office, they, they, was, they believed so much in this stuff, they went around arresting as many medium psychics and astrologers as they could find in Awful. Berlin. Okay? So, oh, yeah. once again, just, just goes to show how much the occult was, was thought of within the Nazi party. One of the stranger rumours about occult activity is that they were attempting to create Vril powered UFOs. Yeah. Okay. Which is where we come on to the Vril Society. Now I know that you know about this. What What do you know? Do you want to give us a quick well, rundown you, you, of what you, you do? You give me know? a rundown of what you have for the Vril. Okay. So do you know Do you know, know where that came from? Do you know the background of it? I know a little bit of the background of it. Okay. So I'm just going to bring up a book on screen. Uh, so that is the Coming Race or Vril, The Power of the Coming Race, which was published anonymously in 1871. Oh, this goes back a long way, though. Way back. Oh, yes, like way. it's ancient. Late 19th... I was going to say, there was no title on the book, so, no. and that was a... Late, late 19th a century. <laughs> late 19th century. And they later found out it was actually the order Edward Bulwer-Lytton who wrote this, or Lytton. Um, he was a fiction writer, right? He was a fiction writer, but he also did write non-fiction, but he was probably okay. fiction. Now, the narrator in the book, bearing in mind at the time this came out and it was anonymous and nobody knew who'd written it, Okay, so the narrator goes into a subterranean utopia, a lot of people talk about hollow earth theory, mm. where angelic beings utilised an all-permeating fluid called Vril, 
okay, which was an energy source that they could harness to have control over matter. So it could heal, it could destroy, they could use it to power technology, okay? Um, Willie Ley, don't know if you know about him at all? No. German rocket engineer, okay? He emigrated to the United States before the war in 1937, okay? Oh. Now, he published an article titled Pseudoscience in Naziland in 1947, where he claims that there was something called the Society for Truth, which was based in Berlin and were actively seeking real, this liquid energy source, okay? Uh, Berger and Pohls um, claimed in the Morning of the Magicians in 1960 that within the Thule Society was an organisation called the Vril Society, yeah. okay? Um, so there was some debate as to whether they exist or not, but they are mentioned in other documentation that's been recovered in, uh, sorry, from the 1930s, okay? Oh, wow, okay. They later claimed, well, Pohls did, that the Vril Society was founded by General Karl Haushofer, okay? And Haushofer was allegedly the student of uh, Russian magician George Gurdjieff, okay? And later became a professor. So he was a general in World War I, later became a professor. As a professor, he was very close friends with a student of his, Rudolf Hess, the deputy oh, wow. Führer. Oh, wow. Okay, okay, that ties in. So, once again, showing how ingrained the occult was with, within yeah. the upper echelons. Now, we're going to move on now to, to Nazi technology, okay? So I'm just going to swipe That's off of that. This is where it gets interesting. So they were probably better known for their technological achievements than they were their occult practices. But as we all know, after the war, Operation Paperclip brought over 1,600 German scientists. Werner von Braun. Including Werner von Braun, yeah, who helped to develop the V2. Uh, they well, brought them over. Moon, well, he got the US five, on the moon. He, he got the US on the moon. He, he did, yeah. yeah, yeah. He made the Saturn V rocket. So they brought him over from Germany, okay? Now, German engineering during World War II led to loads of advancements in uh, guided weapons, long range weapons, rockets, jets. Night vision. To be fair, meth. like back when like they, <laughs> they built the V two, yeah, well, back when they built the V two rocket, like you know, Americans literally couldn't lift off a bag of sugar, you know, and, and put that any more than several meters into the sky, Bread and they one. were and they were firing stuff which could effectively reach orbit. It was like it was nuts. But yeah. the, the the jump and the difference between what the Germans could do and what the rest of the world could do, technologically speaking. Well, less, yeah. less came than when 50, it came to rockets. Less than fifty nuts. years earlier, the Wright brothers only just lifted off the ground. Yeah. yeah, less than that. Yeah, wait, wait, it was incredible the speed of development. Absolutely incredible. And, and that's what a lot of people say about the advancements. There was, yeah, there was there was a there was literally like a, a light switch moment, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Like suddenly, oh look, we can figure out how we can do this, and it came from bugger all. Yeah, yeah. And they, they so, had the, 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 as well. Talk about German um, or Nazi um, advancements. They 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 made other weapons which were a bit more. Well, I talked about well, since the war and a bit more. Well, so like the big rail guns that they came up with and all the. They were the stuff. first ones to put a, a jet-powered fighter into service. Like load that happened in World War Two, the yeah. end of World War Two, admittedly. Yeah. It wasn't very reliable, but that they were always making advancement in technology. And, and it's not just the Nazis that were doing that during the war as well. We we covered it obviously in um, one of our last episodes about the Philadelphia yeah. experiment. Yeah. yeah. You know that the, they the were Americans experimenting were as well, to, as we agreed that we're. They were trying to cloak their ships so that they weren't available. And I'm sure the Nazis were doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, it's a race the whole way through, isn't it? It, re it really was. It really was. I mean, it's um, obviously sort of mirrored in the Cold War afterwards. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the 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 big thing and where there was a big leap, um, which publicly didn't really amount to anything, was uh, from 1942, where the war wasn't going so great no, for the Germans. No, it turned okay? then, didn't it? It did, and then that's where they started developing the Wunderwaffe, which we were talking about, the miracle weapon projects, okay? So many of which were complete waste of time, to be frank. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with things like the Panther tank? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the, the Panther tank was awful. It was rushed in production, it had numerous technical faults, it had mechanical issues, it was expensive to produce, it wasn't great, okay? Or was it, was it that the guys were so high on meth? That we're operating. Then. There was a lot of it's meth reason, going around. There was a back lot then. of meth during Me the war. Medicinal meth. Yeah. Um, Half the reason why thing. we won the war is because of meth. Yeah, scatty. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, so, but other than these things, there were lots of rumours um, about other projects which were maybe yeah. a little bit more out of this world. So you've got things like um, the Sonnengewehr is well documented. Do you know about? 
That's Good all. pronunciation, Spence. Explain. Thank you. So it's uh, it's an orbital sun gun. So they what? were trying to develop a, 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 a almost like a mirrored satellite which could reflect the sun's rays to create a sort of yeah. powerful beam of sunlight. Yeah. Like a magnifying sunlight. glass almost. Yeah. What, so like attack other countries around the globe? Yeah. Well, not their own, yeah. yeah. Well, not their own, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then you hear rumours about other things. So, for oh. example, in the book uh, Intercept UFO, Renato Vesco mentioned something called the fireball, with fireball, which was alleged to be a, a sort of jet-propelled homing flak mine that they could use. Brilliant. Okay, really, really, really weird stuff. That is strange. Um, now, obviously, all we really saw on the surface was things like the Panther tank, but after 1944, um, the term Foo Fighter started to be used. That's a band, which, isn't it? We've fronted by Dave Grohl. Which was, uh, yeah. to fly one of my personal <laughs> favourites. But I always wondered where that name came from, though. Well, the, the Foo Fighters were seen by. Um, yeah, but well, it is from that. That's what that's what they named. That's, it, I, that's, yeah, that's what, what I mean. I always wondered where the name. But the, the, the Foo Fighters were reported by. It was by Russian and by U.S. and British pilots, wasn't it? And there were like orbs yeah. of light that would go around their aircraft yeah. and basically disrupt all their instruments, do some manoeuvres, and then basically bugger off. No, no, I don't think there was ever been a report of any Foo Fighter downing anything, yeah. but it was almost like um, you know, just basically just observing. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Or basically trying to, maybe trying to do something. Maybe they knew if, if it is what you think it is. Maybe it was it's just, or maybe, maybe if we, could be. Maybe if could it was, be. you know, I love an alien Ver, Werner Von Braun but did say we had help from others. We up had there. help from others, didn't we? Yeah, mm. he did say. Did he say that? He did, yeah. that's a quote, yeah. yeah. They did it might not be verbatim what he said, but it was to that a effect. A lot of Air yeah. Force pilots, and, they, and obviously US um, pilots during the war, did report seeing UFOs yeah. during dogfights and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Loads. And then obviously there's rumours of things like well, the Nazis having Alan bases Hein's, on the moon. Was it, wasn't it Heinick that said that? Uh, Jay Alan Heinick. No, that was, it was Von Braun. It was Von Braun. It was said Von it, was Braun, it? yeah. And he was in charge of getting America on the moon, mm -hmm. that guy. And that's what he said. Yeah. yeah. It's madness. So, I mean, move, moving on a little bit, and this does seem a little disconnected to the question, but I am getting to a point here. Yeah. So, are you are either of you familiar with Hans Kammler? Yes. Okay. I've not heard of the guy, no. Right. So, that's, that's Hans Kammler there. Now, he was a Apparently. general, okay, that was put in charge of many advanced weapons projects, including the V-2 missile. So, he was um, above Werner von Braun, you know. Yeah. I wouldn't say managed him, but, you know, was, was in control it of the project. He was just direct him in line. line. He kept yeah. him in line, yeah. Um, and the jet programs, um, which he uh, was put in charge of at the beginning of 1945, okay? Now, in April 1945, he was ordered to defend the Nordhausen area, but instead he ordered the destruction of all special V-1 equipment, okay? And then was alleged by his wife, his driver, and an aide to have died in May via taking a cyanide capsule. That's May 1945? Uh, 45, yeah. Yep. Okay. He used to hide them in their teeth. Yeah. And he used to crack it when there was no other option to yeah, get out of the to, situation. To get out. You still have films, don't you? Oh, well, yeah. They, they used to search it them, they used to, hide it. they used to hide it in a hollowed out tooth. Yeah. So that way nobody could find it, and then when they were wow. left alone, they'd crack it. Yeah. However, our old friend Werner von Braun crops up. He claimed that he'd overheard Kamler talking about how he was going into hiding. Okay. And okay. the famous British historian Mark Felton claims that Kamler almost certainly survived World War II. Okay. Dr. Stephen Greer, who we all know as director of the Disclosure Project, yes. even said that there was evidence that Werner von Braun and other scientists were working on a special kind of propulsion system. Okay. okay. So, lots, lots going on. And Stephen Greer, I think, is an extremely credible um, person to quote. Oh, oh, I mean, a... he. Really? I... He, he, to, to explain to everybody, he has briefed a number of world leaders in recent times on. Aliens and UFOs, so in, including, the Clinton, including the Clintons. Yeah, and during, yeah, the Clintons. Bill Clinton's tenure. Oh, there's, there's just something about Stephen Greer that unsettles me. There's what nothing specifically that he said. Well, no, I think sometimes he just comes out with some things that are so fantastical. Well, maybe you just not. You, you know, like you know, like people turn around and believe in certain things. Like I think we, we're quite open that we, you know, our minds aren't we're so open. open our brains will fall out, but like that isn't an issue for him. I think if so, if so you give him any. Type of evidence, no matter how small, I think he's like soaks it all up and believes it immediately. All right, okay. okay. So Thanks. I'm not saying all of he says is nope. true or not true. I'm just saying I think not everything. Well, I'm I'm almost at the end of my history lesson, and then I'm going to do a brief midpoint wrap up. Okay, but the next point I'm going to come on to is Henge. I know you know about. I've this. seen this. You know I've this? seen yeah, you yeah, yeah. the Henge. I like the Henge. Okay. I've read a lot about this. It's not Stonehenge though. No, it's not. Although you could see where it could become a Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just saying, ancient astronauts. Um, but 
the, the Henge or the flytrap is based in Silesia, Poland. Okay, now a lot of people claim, and this is the, the sort of general consensus, that it was a concrete support base for a water cooling tower at a coal mine. Okay, however, the Nazis devoted a ton of military resources to that area, way too much for just a simple coal mine. Okay. Now, as it turns out, in 1944, Kamler inherited from a, a chap named Albert Speer the responsibility of Project Reiser, okay? Project Giant, it translates to, okay. which involved the construction of a number of massive underground complexes in the Owl Mountains of Lower Silesia. Okay? And we know that they did that because there is a lot of these underground oh, complexes tons of them. Yeah, there's tons just of them, all yeah. over Europe. With hidden chains they found them. bits. Yeah, the, uh, the Austria, Germany... The Red, the Red Army uh, took the area and found them. Um, now, it was being constructed by forced labour, okay? So prisoners of war, prisoners from concentration camps. Disgraceful. Um, it is disgraceful, yeah. but an estimated total of 5,000 victims lost their lives working What, for there? Working on... Uh, yeah, in Owl Mountains, which is where that is. Yeah, yeah, well, it, it is, yeah it's, it's incomprehensible nowadays. Mm, it's crazy. It's mental. But... All documents in the base were allegedly burned prior to the arrival of Allied Special Forces, leading people to believe that Project Giant was a classified research facility, not just a coal mine, not just some underground bunkers. And despite Germany relocating large parts of its strategic armaments to Lower Silesia, when the Red Army did arrive in May 1945, they found absolutely nothing. Nothing? Nothing. Nada. 5,000 people dead on this project. It's called Project Giant, which would indicate it's probably something quite big. Big project for Kamler. Nothing. Okay? Now, here's where I do my little wrap-up, where I tie all these little pieces together. Yeah, if I was going to say, ready. there's been a lot of tangents. It's been a lot of tangents. See what it's doing. been very knowledgeable, isn't it? It has been. He's far. done a lot of research. Well, quite serious. I mean, we know a lot about this, but this I am is, serious. I'm learning it's an interesting more stuff subject. listening to him. So, so to summarise, the Fool Society funds what becomes the Nazi Party. Okay? Yes. Within the Thule Society is the Vril Society, which is seeking a mythical liquid energy source, Vril, which is started by General Haushofer. Hitler rises to power, and the deputy Führer is Haushofer's friend and student, Rudolf Hess. Hess betrays Hitler at the end of the war on the advice of an astrologer, leading to the arrest of astrologers, mediums, and psychics in Berlin. At the same time, scientists are trying to create miracle weapons to win the war. Known occultist, Himmler, gets the projects transferred to the military SS, many of which are then led by General Kamler. Kamler defies orders for seemingly no reason, destroys a bunch of documentation and equipment, and allegedly commits suicide, but Werner von Braun hears him saying he's going into hiding. Kamler is from Stettin, which is in Poland, and was the head of Project Giant, which was also in Poland, where these black budget projects were allegedly taking place. Okay? Kamler disappears at the exact same time that the Red Army arrives at the Owl Mountains, and they find nothing of Project Giant, despite the enormous construction project that was going on there and all the military resources which were put to the region. Okay? Fast forward to 1997, and the police intelligence officer gives Witkowski the documents from the interrogation of Lieutenant General Sporenberg, who says that they were testing a device at Owl Mountain known as Die Glocke, which utilised Zerum 525, a liquid which controlled matter and could be used as a power source, which is exactly what the Vril Society was looking for. Yeah. So you can see this all it, it ties, ties in. in. Yeah. It's I this mean, very intricate web of intrigue. And it's here. not just information from one place here. It's information from a number of yeah. different places. You, you've done well with this, but you've pulled it all together. Thank it's you. Like some um, CSI shit. Thank it you. It is, to be fair. We should become investigative journalists. We, we can't be. Well, we are. <laughs> <back of his laughs> I'm not going to take any credit for his work. So the, the, question, the question is there, what happened to Kamler and did he take the bell? Okay, and I'm just going to quickly put on a video of um, Igor Witkowski, who is the gentleman who wrote the, uh, the book uh, about the Wood of Affa, which we were talking about, which gives a little bit of his opinion. I don't know what happened to Kamler. I don't know. I'm not sure, so I will not say anything about it. But uh, perhaps, along with Kamler, perhaps, but uh, uh, the project was just... Uh, there, is, there was no continuation after the war. As far as I know, I didn't find any credible information that would suggest that uh, the project or the, the scientific theories that I mentioned, that it was developed after the war. So you can see there from Witkowski, he could find no evidence of what happened to this project or Kamler after the war. And they would have done, because I mean, the, the Soviets were coming in from one side, yep. the Allies from the other. There wasn't really any routes in which they could escape with technology like this. Um, 
it's, it's almost like they were trying to, like with the mine and everything, they were trying to come up with a, a reason to why so many resources were put there. But because yeah. Germany fell so quickly, it was almost like they didn't have time to do that. So that's why when they got there, there was nothing left. So that's why there was nothing as opposed to anything they could put in this so place to claim what it was. Where did it go? Well, that is the question. Um, here, here's where it gets really interesting, okay? And, and just so that everybody knows, um, we didn't come out with this theory. This is something that's very prevalent on the internet. Uh, we're just talking about it and seeing what we think, okay? So flash forward, December 9th, 1965, to Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. In the okay? US of A. In the US of A. There is a fireball, or considering we've just been talking about fireballs, but a fireball reported by citizens in both the US and Canada. And it went over something like six states, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, passed over the border between Detroit, Michigan and Windsor, Canada. There are reports of hot metal debris landing, grass fires, sonic booms overhead. Oh, wow. The Federal Aviation Administration received 23 reports from pilots at the time about this incident. Okay, Being bright as hell, because it happened at night, didn't it? So yep. You'd see it. And a seismograph near Detroit recorded the shockwaves created by the fireball as it passed through the atmosphere. So something was there, okay? Now, in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, citizens reported something crashing in the woods, wisps of blue smoke, it's vibrations, and Sorry. a thump. It's always in the woods. It is always in the woods. We just Weirdly. talked about this in rendition of Yeah, but actually think about it. If you if you think and always about Americans. No, yeah, always Americans. Always if Americans, you... always in the woods. Yeah, but, yeah. but but think about it. I mean, there's if you look at the actual scale of America in general, like the vast majority of it is not populated areas. True. So I'm going to say it would be it would be naturally be unlikely that it would hit a populated area anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to change. A, the well, technically, it landed near a populated area. It landed in Kecksburg. Yeah. But Kecksburg is like a remote area. In it's, itself. Not it's not massive. It's not massive. It's like imagine you tell someone I said something landed in in Cornwall, where we are. It probably landed in a field. I'm going to change the like, question. Do you know what I mean? Do aliens land in the woods <laughs> instead of bears? Go on, carry on. Do oh, bears well. land in the woods? Do do, do aliens <laughs> land in the woods? So. The area was immediately uh, sealed off on the order of the US Army and State Police, okay, who, according to local papers, were awaiting the arrival of Army engineers and civilian scientists, okay? And at the time, many, many astronomers said that it was a meteor bolide burning up in the atmosphere, okay? And that was corroborated with the Defense Department in Washington. So they said, yep. it's a meteor, okay? However, 40 years later, in 2005, NASA releases a statement saying that they had examined fragments from the area and determined that, no, it wasn't a meteor, it was a Soviet satellite, okay? Leslie Keane, who's an investigative journalist, didn't believe that. She went after NASA under the Freedom of Information Act and said, you need to release these documents, and NASA got given a court order, okay? In 2007, two years afterwards, NASA said, we're really sorry, but we lost all of the records during the 90s. Just lost it. Lost, lost records of it, apparently, convenient. yeah. Convenient. So well, it's fair, convenient I mean, that they've come out 40 years later to say it was a satellite. I mean, to be fair, NASA yeah, probably... Yeah, they didn't need had, to, did they? Didn't need to. Probably have a lot of records, though, NASA. I mean, their, their vault is probably pretty it's, excessive. Yeah, it's probably well, pretty excessive. Part of dis yeah, come on. But I, mean, I think, it, but like I said, I, this could be part of, like, disclosure or something, you know, with, with everything. You know, leak little bits of information out little by little by little. What yeah. people were shocked about, though, in the area, Spence, when this alleged... Uh, thing crashed. Yeah, was the lockdown that happened so quickly? Yeah, it um, was, and the army presence so yes. was quite big, wasn't well, it? Well, here, here is I here mean, is where it gets quickly, interesting. Didn't they? they wouldn't do that for a normal meteor. No, here no. is where it gets the interesting. World, uh, the Earth every day. So, so they, so they, so, they, so obviously the the. The, you know, NASA says it's a satellite and we didn't really recover anything. Everybody else says it's a meteorite, Department of Defense, oh, it's a meteorite. Eyewitnesses from Kecksburg insist that something landed there that night. Not one well, I Landed or crash landed? Crash landed. Okay. Not one, not two, multiple, multiple people. Okay. Now this object, dubbed the acorn, uh, was partially buried in the ground where it crash landed and described as a, a sort of bronze coloured metal, uh, 10 to 12 feet long, with markings on a band near the bottom that resembled hieroglyphics. Like de Glocker. Like de Glocker. De Bell. Okay. Now, dozens of people in the area claim to have seen it, okay? And it's a major, major event for Kecksburg, okay? It's often described as Pennsylvania's Roswell, okay? And they, they, they've got a replica of it. They have a, a giant replica, which I can bring up, actually, on screen there. Um, a giant replica of the UFO. Um, I'll be honest with you, it was, it was made for a TV show and then they kept it. So it's not entirely accurate as to what was depicted. <laughs> it looks like a few other things it, there. I mean, I wasn't going to say gonna that. Go, I'm going to go down the route of a champagne no, cork. A, gu a gumdrop. I can think of something more rude. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so... 
day. So anyway, so they, they still have this replica app, right? And uh, they also hold annual UFO festivals over there. Okay, so it's a big, it's a, it's a big thing for That's them. excellent. Um, Kexberg, a naughty tale. Now, ju just to give a bit of credibility to this, many of the reports actually come from members of the volunteer fire department who were working that night and investigated the crash, okay? Yeah. So you've got Jim Mays, who is the assistant chief. He was prevented from reaching the ravine by military personnel. James Romansky Sr., who was a firefighter, recalls he saw the craft, saw it crash landed, and recalls two men coming out of the woods who told them the area was quarantined, moved the team on. When they got back to the fire station, there was wall-to-wall -wall military personnel. And they what, commandeered, the they commandeered the fire station, okay? They also commandeered uh, a local farmhouse, which was the closest thing to the crash site. And resident Lillian Hayes, who, who was at the property, recalls that the military was coming in and out of the house all evening, yeah. making a bunch of phone calls, but that none of the phone calls showed up on her telephone uh, bill after the event. So it was almost like they'd been wiped off the face of the earth, okay? Wow. Um, John Hayes, who also lived at the property, was only 10 years old at the time, and recalls later that night that a military convoy carrying a giant object from the crash site on a flatbed truck went by. See, Did it look like that? Yeah. Oh, well, it was covered. It was okay. covered. Over my, 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 my yeah. thing is, right, it, Terrifying the, the problem with the meteorite issue is if a meteorite that size yeah. slammed into that area, a considerable amount, I mean, I'm not a physicist, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much would be, like, destroyed around it, but the, I mean, if something of a ton it took up the got through the atmosphere and it was, like, physically that side when it impacted, the shock wave and the yeah. destruction would be huge. Massive. Like, Miles, it would be massive. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So for it to not damage much around the outside area yeah. it would indicate to me that it, it wouldn't have been an asteroid or it, it wasn't well, going that quickly not, or it managed to slow down. Well, not only that, but James Romansky Sr., so the firefighter that was there, in his words, why the big mystery? Yeah, what a big, if it's a meteorite, why not get it out and go, look, it's a meteorite. I've, I've got a theory about this, Spencer, but I hope you, you, uh, you want to go through some more stuff. Well, what I was going to do quickly is just show you guys a couple of news reports. One from WTAE-TV um, and some clips from Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. Oh, legend. Where they interview some of the firefighters and witnesses that were there at the time. Okay, so I'm just going to play that quickly awesome. now. I was here at least two or three hours standing right here. Ron Struble was 23 when the whatever it was happened. He saw the military guarding the area, not letting anyone close, eventually hauling the object away. The government initially said it was never here. And after we got our assignment and everybody knew what they were doing, they took us in pickup trucks up the road up here. There was no wings. There was no motors. There was no propellers. There was no identification whatsoever that were identified as an aircraft that I would know. It was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle from the distance I was at. My personal opinion of what landed in Kecksburg that night was a, a, a capsule of some kind. Uh, from where, whether it was one of ours or a foreign, I have no idea. Uh, the military wouldn't let us get to the scene, so... Uh, I have no idea, but I know it wasn't a meteor. Okay, so as you can see there, it's it's a bunch of firefighters. Some great facial there. hair going on there some, as well. Some fantastic and facial hair. Mullet. That, that mullet. mullet. I'm jealous of that I might add, mullet. that's not up-to-date footage of the people involved. Well, so he no longer has the mullet. I don't know this for a fact. Not up-to-date mullet. Mullets are up-to-date, surely. We're bringing it back, people. Okay, bring it back. Maybe not right now, but um, <laughs> anyway, so my grand summary, how am I going to tie this all together, okay? So to summarise the Kecksburg event, a UFO was spotted across multiple states, reported by pilots, civilians, detected on a seismograph. The UFO crashes in Kecksburg, Pennsylvania, and is found by firefighters until the military arrives, quarantines the area, and commandeers the fire station and a house close to the crash site. The military is seen removing things from the site by other residents, however claim nothing was recovered. The official word is it's a meteor. NASA later claims it was a satellite, but says that they've lost the records, okay? So something doesn't add up. Now here's the crux of the conspiracy theory and the question that we're being asked, and this is what the theory is online. As Kamala and the device disappeared at the same time and were never found, the theory goes, with Allied forces approaching, Kamala destroyed many of the projects he was heading up and piloted the Glocker, utilising its anti-gravity and time travel abilities, which led to it crash landing in Pennsylvania 20 years later. 
Given the description of the device, the rapid military mobilization and the secrecy surrounding the event, conspiracy theories ask, are the Kecksburg Acorn and De Glocker one and the same? Okay, so I'm gonna pop this up on screen and you guys can discuss. Right, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a jump in. Go for it, Tom. Right, so I'm, I think it's too much of a stretch of the imagination to say that he disappeared and then reappeared 20 odd years later. I don't think that happened, right? However, what I do think is more likely is that he escaped and fled, mm -hmm. maybe to a different country, okay? Yeah. We'll leave it at that for a minute. But I think the bell was seized at some point by, I would say, US, could be Russian, who knows? Okay? The Allies. Because the Russians so got there, So it could be that they? they claimed not to have found anything. 100%. So it was the Russians that got there It first, was the Russians. It? So the yeah. Russians, and this would explain a couple of bits, right? The so Silesia, the Russians get it. So, yeah. The Russians are then on the back foot because they don't have all the research. So it takes them 15, 20 years to kind of figure out how to use it. They're then using it and they end up over Kecksburg and it crashes, right? Yeah. Which then would alert, and obviously you'd imagine with US intelligence that they have an idea that they had hold of this thing. Yeah. Brilliant, it's crashed in our country, let's immediately get there, which would probably explain your kind of military yeah. presence and why everything was all kept hush hush. I don't even think anybody's probably in it, to be honest with you. Um, but that would then explain the secrecy, the cover up, because it's clearly not a meteorite, because if anything that they had on a flatbed truck actually physically hit that impact, as a meteorite, I mean, it would make it would be like washing yeah. Armageddon. Right? Yeah, it'd be ridiculous. Um, so, I think it existed. I think it's been back engineered probably twice, to, because obviously it would have had to have been the Germans would have had to have initially figure out how to make it work or or what have you, or have to create it using obviously like real or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then obviously it's taken a while for the Russians, oops, sorry, to catch up. And I think potentially that's what it is. And now it's probably in the hands of. The Americans, okay. and maybe America and Russia all have. The, maybe everybody has all this technology now, and we're just not being told about it. But yeah, yeah, I think part of the answer is yes. Is it the same thing? Yes. Is it him popping it, out twenty years same, later after time traveling? No. Is it I the same believe, thing? Yes. Is it the same one? No. No. I think right. that I, that, that I can't get over the time travel thing. No, I, I really can't struggle either. with time travel. Okay. I really, I, I think it is over like, if you're talking space and great distance is fine, but within the planet, no, I don't reckon it's possible. What do you reckon? I agree with Tom to a large part, um, but I don't think, I think they're two separate incidents and I don't think they're related. So I agree that during the bell, I think the bell existed. What it did, I'm not sure. Yeah. There's a lot of theories out there to suggest it could be one of the first ever nuclear reactors and the Germans were working on that kind of tech. There is a lot talked about that online. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but it, it, it could be something like that. They were looking to utilize different technology to, to make a weapon or make power or whatever, generate power. Um, in Kecksburg, I believe NASA, as much as they've lost it, they might have thought it's so insignificant they've just lost the paperwork. I actually, in this sense, believe them. I think it was a Soviet um, satellite that, that crashed. That would explain why there'd be an incredibly heavy presence of military in the area, because that was it, it during the Cold War. It's true, it's a good point. It was during the Cold War. Well, that some in, of the in satellites 65, were massive. That, that, during, you know, that, some of the massive satellites, around, we knew about Sputnik yeah. and all this sort of stuff, they were shaped similarly. They, could, they were developed, as we know, by scientists that worked for the Nazis. Yeah. Some went to Germany after, sorry, some went to the US, US after yeah. the war, some went to the Soviets after the war. It's logical to think that they had the same ideas about how to put something together. Okay. So potentially that's a Russian satellite that had been developed by the same scientists that worked on de Glock or whatever it was during the well, war mm. that developed it. That would explain why aesthetically it looks the same. Although you had a video you wanted me to play, didn't you? Yes, yeah, so I have a video which I found online, which is actually a recent video from a SpaceX launch. Okay, you ready? I've seen this online. And in the background, there is a, a bell, or you could call it a triangle, but the, the way that it comes across looks a bit like a bell, and it goes straight across the, uh, straight across the camera, straight across the image. Put it on. What we're about to see could change history. Watch this. With that, 
it goes behind the satellite. Okay. Yeah, it does. Not in front of the satellite. It's not superimposed. So it's it's the size that you'll see. It's I say it can't be. It's not the same. I mean, it's bigger than the satellite, but it's it's not a small piece of debris. Because if it was a small piece of debris, it would have been in front, not behind it. So, and it's just moving in such a. I mean, it's not changing direction or anything. It's an odd. But bit. it's an odd thing to see. And you, yeah, all right, yeah, you can say debris or what have you, but it's just weird that it's that shape and the way that it moves and the mm. way it went behind it is obvious. I mean, if that is something that's come off something, it's a big chunk. Do you know so, what I mean? So if, I agree. It's, if somebody pointed it out saying, oh, is this the bell? And I looked at it and I was like, whether it is or isn't, it's still pretty cool footage. Do you want me to give you a really, another boring history lesson quickly? Do it. Go, Go on. Go, Go for okay. it. So aerospace scientist David Myra pointed out, right, okay, if the Germans actually had this sort of technology, why would they not have used it against the Allies? Good point. Okay? I can And another agree. one, if von Braun was involved, then why would he not have used the technology when he went to work for the US? Okay? Now, one of the big theories about the Bell is it was either a cyclotron particle accelerator designed to help with the Nazi nuclear weapons project yeah. or a heavy water nuclear reactor, albeit small and experimental, okay? Now, the shape of it, if it was a cyclotron, is probably due to the fact that they'd have used an old obsolete pulse and arc transmitter, electromagnet. Now, that's what Ernest Lawrence used, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in Physics in 1939 for inventing the cyclotron, so before this happened, and later went to work on the Manhattan Project. Um, and if it's a heavy water nuclear reactor, the Germans were synthesizing heavy water they were, using yeah. hydroelectric plants in Norway. Okay, and then the Norwegian resistance and the Allied bombers destroyed that in 1944. When they recovered the manifest of the remaining water, there was only 500 kilograms. I and mean, that you need at least five tons to operate a nuclear reactor. So they'd used a lot of it, is what they're saying. They, they either had loads of it and it got destroyed, or, or they, didn't have enough. they didn't have enough, okay? Now, somebody not in the know could have seen that and assumed that the heavy water was in some way powering the device and mistaken it for Vril or Zerum 525 or whatever. And then the reasoning behind why the Germans didn't use the technology and why von Braun didn't take the technology to the US, is that the technology may well have already existed, but the Germans sucked at using it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's highly possible, isn't it? So, it could maybe, be. Well, obviously, they, they, that's true, though. I mean, if, if it yeah. hadn't have worked, then why would Von Braun have gone to America and then just, but actually, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have used it, would he? Because it didn't work. Apparently, he poured a lot of money towards the end of the war in a desperate bid into his wonder weapons. Who, Hitler? Yeah, Hitler, right? So my, another theory about the kind of like thinking about if the Russians got it, what if they hadn't completed it and got it to work yet? And it's taken them 20 years to get it to work. So like, oh, they're onto something here. And they've well, kind it didn't of, work. They've they, had they, to they finish it. It's yeah. taken them, I mean, it they could have taken them. They it didn't work. How, well, that's the point. That's Is the it, point. If you think it's the same thing. If you think it's the same thing. Yeah, I don't. There we go. But I think that it's, it's interesting. I think there's evidence to say there were definitely something. There's not enough evidence. Okay, That's so why. Because whether we think that the bell was a reverse engineered craft or a time machine or anti gravity or whatever, whether we feel that the Kecksburg acorn was, uh, you know, a, a craft or a satellite or a meteor, do you think it's the same thing? So the question That's is, the question. It, did a secret Nazi device travel through time and crash land in the 60s in the USA? There is no evidence to connect the two other than that he looks similar. So is that a no? That's a no. Tom? It's a no. I don't believe it travelled through time. I completely agree. But I would like to state for the record, though, that I do think um, the bell is definitely something. I think that it might well be a craft of some sort. Yeah. But it definitely didn't travel through time and end up in Katzburg. I, I agree. So I think it's something. I'm, I'm unsure as to what the bell was, and I'm unsure about. But we Kecksburg, agree it was a thing. But I, uh, yeah, I agree, I it's, agree a it's a thing too. Um, but but the question is, do you think that it time travelled into Katzburg? No. No. no, no. There is nothing to connect it other than a, a, a similar appearance. And as we've seen in that video, um, there are other things out there with that appearance. So no, I don't think it is. Well, Merry so, Christmas Jingle Bells. The bell, everybody. We have come to a consensus, which feels weird. But it's a Christmas miracle, everybody. So, <laughs> Tom, what can people do? They need to. 
like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon. The bell? Which phone seems very apt, doesn't it? The bell. It does. The bell. I never even thought Make about sure that you hit the bell, people, and have a wonderful Christmas from all of the team here at Aliens and Stuff. Thank you.